On a beach in southern Italy, a group of desperate men wander the coast, looking for salvation. Mere days ago, they had been some of the most powerful men in the world. Leaders of Rome, they had been called the saviors of the people and ranked amongst the city's founders and historic heroes. Now those same people who had once adored them had labeled them as traitors and enemies of the state. They had killed their friends and colleagues, forced them from their homes, and made them live the lives of fugitives and outlaws, begging favors from strangers to buy another day's safety. And now, the end seemed near. The countryside was hostile to them. Even the friends that they still had left would not take them in, for fear of the terrible consequences that might fall on them and their families. Those consequences that came closer with each passing minute. Optimistically, they had a day left of freedom. Realistically, they had hours at most. Yet as they sat on that abandoned beach and contemplated their sorry state, their leader remained hopeful. Seeing that spirits were low, he cheered everyone up with a story from his childhood. For when he was a young boy, wandering the fields of his hometown of Arpinum, he happened upon an eagle's nest, which fell from a tree and into his cloak. In the nest were seven baby birds, a rare miracle. Eagles typically laid no more than two eggs at a time. The brood was so extraordinary that he had taken it to a seer to inspect. The priest declared that the nest and its contents were a sign from the Roman gods, a prophecy that foretold the future of the boy who had been fortunate enough to catch them. He was destined to hold the highest office in the land seven times. Impossible, everyone had thought. It was Roman custom that the highest magistracy, the consulship, could only be held twice in one lifetime. Exceptions to this rule came only from the highest born and noblest Romans, not the lowly sons of provincial Italians. But he had proven them wrong. In his life, he had surpassed all expectations set for him by his humble birth. He had commanded armies, led the state, defied the senate, and been proclaimed Rome's third founder. He had also won elections to the office of consul six times. He explained to his terrified companions that the end could not be near, for it was divinely proclaimed that he would return to his city and hold the magistracy one more time before he died. Although his present circumstances appeared dire, the gods had not yet abandoned Gaius Marius. As he finished his story, two small vessels appeared off the shore. As surely as they had spotted the boats, the boats had also spotted them. Were they friend or foe? There was no way of knowing. But with the certain enemy closing in on all other sides, Marius, careful and diligent planner, a man famed for never taking chances that he didn't have to take, and never fighting battles that he didn't know he could win, gambled. He and his companions leapt into the surf and began swimming towards safety or death. Ancient Rome was a family business. There's a reason that so many Roman names are really long. It's because each one of those names mattered because it was a family link. And family links are what kept the Roman world together. When discussing how they filmed the TV series I, Claudius, the actor Brian Blessed, who played the Emperor Augustus, said that filling the role of a Roman became easier and more natural when he thought about the Italian-American mafia. And I think that this is a relatively good way to think about how Roman noble families worked, especially in the Republican era. Roman families were kind of mafia-esque in that the whole extended family was involved in this massive organization which blended business, family, and politics all kind of into one. Republican Rome was basically run by about 20 noble families, all of whom intermarried and looked out for each other, divided by their competitiveness and united by their desire to keep outsiders out of the zero-sum game of power. And it does sort of remind me of a good mob movie. They scheme, they lie, they backstab. I mean, I look at something like the murder of Julius Caesar, or the mass killings in the prescriptions of the Second Triumvirate, and it reminds me of a scene out of The Godfather, or that bit in Goodfellas when Robert De Niro ties off all of his loose ends. What I'm getting at here is that family defined the Romans, especially Romans from nobility. To be born into a noble Roman house was to have your life's course mapped out in front of you before you were even old enough to walk. 
young Romans would be raised on the tales of their illustrious ancestors and told that it was up to them to either meet or surpass the standards set for them by their ancestors. And this is important in understanding the life of today's subject, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, the man who inadvertently contributed more than any other of his generation to the downfall of the Roman Republic. Sulla was born to the Cornelian Gens, one of the oldest, noblest, and most distinguished extended families in Rome. But his particular branch of the family wasn't exactly the pride and joy of the whole gens. Although Sulla could boast of having numerous illustrious ancestors, they had all lived hundreds of years ago. No one in his family had done anything noteworthy in the last few generations. Even though they had once been one of the leading families of Rome, the Sullas had plummeted a long way. We don't know much about Sulla's father, which is kind of the point. If you're from the Roman nobility, not being famous is only a little bit less bad than being infamous. You know, coming from the Cornelian gens should have given Sulla's father a political office or a military command, but alas, very little can be said about him. His father died when Sulla was still a young man and left him nothing in his will. Possibly because he was disinherited, more likely because his father simply had nothing to leave his son. And so despite his immaculately blue-blooded genes, Sulla spent his adolescence in relative poverty, having to rent a city apartment underneath a freed slave. But this really doesn't seem to have worried the young Sulla all that much. Whilst his peers were off being prepped for military commands and a life in politics, the young Sulla seems to have embraced his new status as amongst the poorest of the city. He became a very close associate with a group of people that most Roman nobles considered untouchable actors, musicians, and entertainers. In our modern world, talented entertainers are often held in pretty high regard. Some of the most respected and beloved people on earth are talented musicians, actors, directors, and artists. This was absolutely not the case in ancient Rome. These people were amongst the lowest of the low, barely above slaves in social status because being an actor or entertainer was associated with seedy and disrespectful and dishonorable behavior. But Sulla was right at home amongst them, and it would be this crowd of, well, as other Romans perceived it, low lives, who would help him turn his fortunes around. Sulla was reportedly quite attractive, maybe not in the traditional sense, but he certainly had a striking look about him. If I were to cast him for a film, I'd go with like a 90s Ed Harris. You know, steely grey blue eyes, sharp jawline, and a harsh, serious glance. I mean, look at this guy. If you ignore the fact that his nose has fallen off, you can see that he's a pretty good looking dude there. Sure, he had some pretty bad skin issues that would inflame periodically throughout his life, but other than that, clear hit with the ladies. He was also personally charismatic, a trait that would help him throughout his life. And this mix of rugged good looks and charisma would lead to him starting a passionate affair with one of Rome's wealthiest escorts, a lady called Nicopolis. Nicopolis was a good few years older than Sulla and soon became completely infatuated with him. She fell in love with him so hard that when she died, she left him as heir to her not inconsiderable fortune. This, along with a small inheritance he got from his stepmother, would help raise Sulla out of his relative poverty. Now all this may on the surface seem a little bit devious. A young Sulla, a man who was defined by his lack of wealth compared to his aristocratic breeding, slumming it out for a few years with the urban poor until he manages to manipulate this wealthy old lady into leaving him her fortune. Makes him seem like a pretty seedy guy. But I don't think even Sulla expected his fortunes to turn around quite so quickly. To start with, I don't think Sulla was keeping the company of these people that his fellow patricians considered to be low lives out of any cynical purpose. And I think this is evidenced in the fact that his love for these people persisted throughout his life. Even when Sulla was a much older man, a leading member of the Senate, a very distinguished figure, and far removed from the poverty of his youth, his closest circle of friends remained these entertainers, actors, and musicians. Plutarch tells us that Sulla had a reputation for unmatched severity when it came to conducting business. He was totally serious, not a smile or laugh was heard from him. But as soon as the day's work was over and the business was concluded, he refused to be serious at all. He would take to the dining table and drink, party, laugh, sing, and dance all the night through 
with people that most nobles would not touch with a 10-foot pole. One of his closest companions throughout his life was a drag queen called Metrobius, who Sulla met when he was young and instantly took to. And even as Metrobius aged and his drag act became less admired and more laughed about, Sulla insisted that he kept performing and would not stop talking about how he was in love with Metrobius. So personally, I think Sulla came into this lucky inheritance less through cynical scheming and more because he genuinely loved his thespian friends and they genuinely loved him. Sulla himself would have likely sneered at the suggestion that he built his own future. Throughout his entire life, he accredited all of his successes, not to himself personally, but to his patron goddess, Fortuna. Sulla was deeply religious and believed that he was naturally lucky. That the goddess of luck personally favoured him was obvious to him from the fact that he had fallen into wealth after his father had fallen out of it. Later in life, he would even take the title Felix, Sulla the Fortunate. Now almost 30 years old, Sulla was finally affluent enough to enter public life. And in the Roman world, there was only one way to do that through the military. In 107 BCE, Sulla, now a caster, was attached to the army of Gaius Marius and dispatched to North Africa. And this is how Lucius Sulla and Gaius Marius met each other. Marius as a general, Sulla as a junior cavalry commander. It's impossible to know what the two men thought of each other when they first met, whether or not they caught in each other's eyes a glimpse of the rivalry that would come to encompass the entire Roman world in a few decades' time, or whether or not they actually got along. The two of them came from very different backgrounds, but both of them endured the prejudices of the Roman elite. Marius was low-born by the standards of a Roman consul. He wasn't even properly Roman. He was born in the provincial Italian town of Arpinum. Had he been born a few years earlier, he wouldn't have even been a proper citizen. Although Marius had been born into a relatively wealthy family, he lacked the aristocratic breeding that was necessary for a Roman career in politics. Now, he had defied this expectation by being elected consul anyway, but he was still derisively labelled a novos homo by elite Romans, a new man, someone who had no illustrious ancestors that they could boast about. Sulla had been born into the opposite situation, blue-blooded to the core, but with no money. This earned him a different type of derision from his peers, one of which turned to him one day and said, how can you be an honourable man, you who have so much wealth, but whose father left you nothing? This reflected a common Roman suspicion of anyone whose wealth was not inherited. It was assumed that if you hadn't inherited your wealth through land, you would come across it through dishonest means. Neither Marius nor Sulla perfectly fit the model of a Roman leader, someone who had both noble and aristocratic birth and inherited wealth. But they were both capable soldiers, which is precisely what Rome needed at the time. For years, the legions in North Africa had been humiliated in a grueling war with a renegade king called Jugurtha. Jugurtha, who had once fought alongside the Roman legions and knew their strengths and weaknesses, had run circles around previous Roman armies. Gaius Marius had been elected to consul on the promise that he would bring this war to a speedy and favourable conclusion. And this all started very well for Marius. In a series of daring moves, he beat the Numidian armies, sacked their cities, and enslaved their people. Soon, huge swathes of the Atlas Mountains were under Roman control, and there was nothing Jugurtha could do to stop him. But unfortunately for the Romans, they weren't fighting a conventional war. Jugurtha was the king of a mostly nomadic people, so even though his cities had been sacked and taken, this didn't mean he was defeated. He simply took to the desert and forced the Romans to chase him further and further west across North Africa. And it was in this phase of the war that Sulla would make a name for himself, using the two traits that had gotten him this far and would take him even further. His infectious charisma and charm, and his stalwart, unshakable belief in his own good luck. So this is how the situation looked when Sulla made the move that would put his name on the map. Jugurtha, the enemy king, was married to the daughter of King Bocchus of Mauritania. And as the Romans pursued him, he had fled into his father-in-law's lands. At first, Bocchus had been happy to help Jugurtha. But then Marius and his army had crossed into his territory and started killing his people. 
and it suddenly dawned on the king of Mauritania that he had just joined the losing side in a brutal war of conquest. So he started rebranding himself, not as an ally of Jugurtha, but as the mediator between Rome and Numidia. To get peace talks underway, he sends envoys to the Romans bearing gifts as a sign of respect. However, the ambassadors soon realise that trudging through the bandit-infested and lawless deserts of North Africa, laden with treasure, is not the safest job in the world, and they are promptly rubbed. Beaten and terrified, the envoys stumble into the nearest Roman camp which just so happens to be commanded by our boy, Sulla. Sulla impressed the Mauritanians by not only believing their story about being robbed, which Sallust tells us not all Romans would have accepted, but also by giving them gifts of his own and providing them with a Roman escort to take them back to their home. And so Sulla opened up a diplomatic channel with King Bocchus of Mauritania, and Marius was so impressed by this that he charged Sulla with being the one to go to the court of the king and get a peace treaty. Now this was an exceptionally dangerous assignment. Sulla and a few companions would have to travel alone, deep into enemy territory, and basically demand a surrender from a king. I mean, best case scenario, he's captured and used as a bargaining chip in a peace with Rome. Worst case scenario, he's tortured to death. But Sulla, ever trusting in his own good luck, set out anyway. He marched into the court of King Bocchus, strode up to where the king was sitting, flanked by two of Jugurtha's representatives, and he began negotiating. Peace talks went nowhere initially. The Romans would accept nothing less than the unconditional surrender of Jugurtha, and Jugurtha wouldn't accept any deal that saw him dethroned. But later that evening, when Sulla had returned to his own camp, his luck that he relied on so much finally turned when he received a message from King Bocchus requesting a secret meeting. When the Mauritanian and the Roman were in the same room together, King Bocchus addressed Sulla, and he started saying, look, I never wanted this war with Rome. I don't want to fight the Romans. All that happened is my son-in-law came to me asking for help, and I gave him refuge for a few weeks. Who wouldn't do the same for their own family? And when the Romans had crossed my border and started sacking my towns, I simply defended my own people. King Bocchus didn't want a rivalry with Rome, so he said that he was willing to cut Jugurtha loose, as much as it pained him to turn his back on a family member. He would turn a blind eye to the Roman war, provided it stayed out of his lands, and in return he agreed that he would not take any of his armies outside of Mauritanian borders. Sulla listened respectfully, and he responded with empathy. The Romans don't want to hurt Bocchus, they don't want to kill the innocent Mauritanian people. Peace would be good for everyone, they agree. But just turning your back on Jugurtha isn't enough anymore. Bocchus, however reluctantly, had raised his hand against Rome, and the Romans had proven that they were the stronger people. In the few battles that they'd fought, the Romans stumped the Mauritanians every time. If they wanted to, they could destroy his kingdom. So looking at it that way, if the Romans agree to a peace, they're kind of doing Bocchus a favour, and simply abandoning Jugurtha isn't really a suitable repayment for such astoundingly generous terms. If Bocchus wanted to make peace with the Romans, he would need to hand Jugurtha over in chains. King Bocchus must have agonised over this decision. The Romans would surely win any war. 99 times out of 100, Mauritania loses hands down. But to betray his own family, his own son-in-law, that would dishonour him forever. And Sulla, despite his aforementioned faith in his own good luck, was probably also a little bit nervous. He had set his terms in stone. Bocchus had a choice, either make a complete enemy of Rome or a complete enemy of Jugurtha. And it was clear that the idea of a full-blown war with Rome had shook him. But had it shook him enough to lead him to betray his own family? Sulla's head could very well end up on the tip of a Mauritanian spear any day now. But finally, Bocchus invited both Sulla and Jugurtha to a proposed peace talk deep in the Atlas Mountains. Both Sulla and Jugurtha probably knew that they were taking their lives into their own hands when they went to this meeting. It was certain that Bocchus would betray one of them. When the time came, both Sulla and Jugurtha met and exchanged pleasantries, and the pretense of peace negotiations was kept up. 
until armed men appeared from their hiding places and fell upon the meeting. And to Solo's undoubted relief, these men attacked Jugurtha and not him. They took the king captive and they killed all of his companions. After seven years on the run, Jugurtha was handed over, tied in chains, to Marius by Sulla. Exciting, right? Sulla venturing into enemy territory and through cunning and daring he apprehends this enemy king with barely any bloodshed and delivers him back to his general, ending a grueling war. That is, oh, what a story, hey? Well, yeah, yeah, no, it, it definitely is. And um, there has to be something said here for Sulla's undoubted bravery and cunning in uh, apprehending Jugurtha, but there's definitely room for a little bit of exaggeration here. Pretty much everything we know about Sulla comes from accounts written after his death, and many of those accounts relied heavily on Sulla's own memoirs for their information. And look, this episode in his life is like Sulla's main selling point for his future career. The Roman people loved a daring military hero, and Sulla knew that, so he likely saw this little episode as what it was, which was a great source of political capital. That's how Sulla saw it, at least. His commanding officer Marius was not so thrilled that his military conquest of Numidia had been undercut slightly by the fact that the final victory was won by one of his subordinates. I mean, sure, Marius got pretty much all of the credit, the parades, the triumphs, the titles, but the fact that people were also talking about this Sulla guy and his daring capture of Jugurtha perhaps began to open up a rift between the two men. And this rift only widened as Sulla advanced through the ranks of the Roman military and became less of a subordinate to Marius and more of a junior partner. During the Cimbric Wars, which were a mass invasion of Gallic and Germanic peoples from the north, Sulla did a great job negotiating alliances, being a cavalry commander and organizing supplies. Don't get me wrong, in the years 106 to 100 BCE, Marius is the main guy, the guy that everyone loves, the guy getting all the credit, and the guy winning all of the elections. But Sulla is still there, sharing a little bit of the limelight. With his new credentials as a competent soldier and diplomat, Sulla began climbing the political ladder. He was elected praetor in 97 on his second attempt at the office and sent to Cappadocia. While in the province, he added to his military record. He restored an allied king of Rome to power, defeated some pirates who were interrupting trade, and became the first Roman magistrate to deal with the newly emerging power in the region the Parthians. All of this is to say that Sulla, through a mix of personal charisma, his own military talent, and if you asked him, good luck, had risen far beyond what he would have expected from life in his 20s. When I introduced him about 10 minutes ago, he was the son of an impoverished family that had hit rock bottom. He had since restored his family's fortunes, been elected to high office, and won for himself a great reputation. Which was just as well, because even as the dust was settling from the Cimbric Wars, new conflicts were looming on the horizon. The Romans had largely pacified their frontiers in the north and south, but new threats to Roman hegemony were emerging in the east and right at home in Italy. As the 90s rolled on, Sulla began to make plans for what he hoped would be the zenith of his political career. He would stand for the consulship, the most powerful and prestigious position in Rome. This is when he started really bigging up his role in the capture of Jugurtha, even having a statue depicting the event erected in Rome, at the expense of his client, King Bocchus of Mauritania. And his chances looked good. He had an easy-going rapport with the common Roman man and with the soldiers, but he was traditional enough to still appeal to the Roman elite. The election was hardly secured, but Sulla was justified in feeling optimistic. However, Sulla's political career was rudely interrupted by the explosive results of a social and political tension that had been bubbling under the surface of Roman Italy for decades now. Now to understand what went wrong in Roman Italy during Sulla's lifetime, we have to understand Roman citizenship and its importance, as well as what Roman Italy looked like at the turn of the first century BCE. Roman citizenship in the era of the Republic was basically access to all of the good things that came with being a Roman, the right to vote, the right to stand for a magistracy, 
a share in the distribution of public lands, and the right to appeal in court cases with Roman judges, which was obviously pretty desirable. And during the Republican era, Romans were pretty stingy when it came to who got citizenship and who didn't, because citizenship meant a share in political decision making, and that was very consequential. And as for the Italians, well they were pretty unique regarding their dynamic with the city of Rome. In Rome's early history, the city was a minor regional power in central Italy, but as time went on, the Romans expanded through war and diplomacy to become the masters of the peninsula. Gradually, the Italian peoples were absorbed into the Roman sphere of influence, but they rarely controlled them directly. Instead, the Italians mostly governed themselves and displayed loyalty to Rome through providing troops to serve in the army. This meant that even after centuries of Roman rule, most Italians maintained their local customs, culture, and politics, separate from Rome. This led to the Romans calling them the Socii, or the Allies. Italy at this time was not a province or central state, but a number of semi-autonomous peoples tied to the Roman Republic via a confusing web of treaties and agreements. However, they were not citizens. Not of Rome, at least. The Italians had no direct voice in Roman politics, they had no hope of ever standing for a magistracy, and they had no protections against the abuses of Roman power. As Rome's empire grew and expanded, this deal came to appear increasingly unfair in the eyes of Italians. It was the people of Italy who supplied Rome with the manpower of her armies, who protected her provinces, and yet they were being denied the fruits of this new order. The Italians were no longer content with just being the subjects of empire, they wanted to be equal partners. The Romans themselves were largely against this. The senators and the nobility didn't want to open up their precious magistracies to these Italian aristocrats. The equestrians didn't want their lucrative contracts being seized by wealthy Italians who would then throw their weight around in the Roman courts. And the urban plebs, the poor, didn't want their already small degree of political influence diluted further by the introduction of tens of thousands of new voters. But there was one other factor standing in the way of Italian citizenship and that was the natural Roman fear towards one man gaining too much power. Let's return to our Mafia analogy from the beginning of this video. At the beginning of the first Godfather movie, Vito Corleone, played by the incomparable Marlon Brando, explains the power dynamic of his business. When Bonacera comes to Corleone asking for justice for his brutally beaten daughter, the Godfather offers to help him. Bonacera tries to offer him money, but Corleone turns away, scorning this as a sign of disrespect. He doesn't want this man's money, he wants him in his debt. He tells him that someday, though that day may never come, he will call upon him to do a service for him in return for this favour. The Romans operated a very similar system. If a Roman did you a favour, they became your patron, and as their clients, you would be obliged to one day return that favour. Now this analogy isn't perfect, there wasn't quite so much cloak and dagger in the Roman world as there was in the Godfather, in fact the Romans practiced this dynamic openly. Powerful Romans would march around the city followed by hordes of clients to show off how influential they were, and a wealthy Roman might measure his success by how many clients appeared at his door in the morning to petition him for favours. But this social system stood in the way of Italian citizenship. Whoever granted it to the Italians would become the patron of all of Italy, and therefore the most powerful man in Rome which no one wanted. And this meant that even Romans who agreed with Italian citizenship in principle were unwilling to let anyone other than themselves be the guy that passed it. So Roman internal competitiveness within the Republic stood in the way of Italian voting rights. The Italian question was at the heart of Roman politics when Sulla made his bid for the consulship. And for what it's worth, ideologically speaking, Sulla was dead set against the Italians his entire life. He was a stalwart defender of the rights of aristocrats like himself to completely dominate Roman politics. But not all of his contemporary politicians agreed with him. Specifically, a tribune of the plebs called Marcus Livius Drusus, who took it upon himself to become the champion of Italian voting rights. And this made Drusus a controversial figure in Rome, to say the least. 
you know, populist tribunes like him came and went, and their careers pretty much only ever ended one way, with them being murdered in the streets of Rome by their political rivals. Drusus shook things up a little bit by not being murdered in the streets of Rome. Instead, he was murdered by an anonymous assassin in the comfort of his own home after being stabbed in the groin, which is nasty. And with Drusus's death, so too did the dream of Italian citizenship die. You know, JFK once said that those who make peaceful change impossible make violent change inevitable. And when it comes to Italian citizenship in the late Roman Republic, that maxim was correct. The murder of Drusus, the man who had built his political career, styling himself the champion of their rights, was the last straw for many Italians and violent revolution broke out in the city of Asculum not long after his assassination. It all started when a Roman praetor by the name of Gaius Civilius Caepio stormed into the city of Asculum and basically just started having a go at the residents. He went in, interrupting a religious festival, mind you, demanded their attention and just started berating them, being like, ah, oh, you, you better not be thinking about agitating for citizenship. I, I'm tired of you no good Italians thinking that you're better than you are. Know your place or, or there'll be consequences. And the people of Asculum responded by tearing him to pieces with their bare hands. And the social war was underway. Although this may sound spontaneous, the Italian rebellion had probably been brewing for a while, because as soon as it erupted, a confederation of Italian states formed very quickly to oppose Rome. Citizenship was no longer the goal. That ship had sailed, and the Italians now wanted independence. The new confederation was named Italia, and they set themselves up at a new capital at Corfinum, where they went about crafting their new state. Although independent from Rome, Italia modelled itself along Roman lines. A senate of 500 aristocrats was set up, with a cursus honorum similar to the Roman one. Coins were minted, showing a boar, the symbol of Italy, brutally goring a wolf, the symbol of Rome, and an independent Italian army was raised, which looked identical to the Roman army, because it was the Roman army. Most legionaries of this era were Italians. As a result, Rome's military largely defected. This was a catastrophe for Rome, not only because they were facing a rebellion, but also because it was right on their doorstep. Corfinum, the rebel capital, was less than a hundred miles from the city of Rome. Immediately, the Romans kicked into gear to try and contain the situation. They split their forces between north and south and started a war of maneuvers with their old allies. Sulla was denied an independent command at the start of this war. Instead, he was attached to the staff of Lucius Julius Caesar, and he watched the guy's flank whilst he messed around in the south of Italy. And Sulla wasn't the only great Roman general to be sidelined in the first months of the war. Gaius Marius, who was of Italian descent himself and sympathetic to their cause, was also kept on the benches in the war's early phases. However, as the war progressed and the need for competent commanders on the Roman side became more dire, both Sulla and Marius gained more authority over their respective theatres. They even teamed up at one point to trap the Marsi people and destroy their army in a decisive battle. This somewhat minor chapter in the social war will go down in history as the last time that Marius and Sulla worked together on anything. The first year of the war didn't go all that well for the Romans, but the rebels had also failed to obtain an ultimate victory. And as the second year of the war began, the Romans began to break the stalemate. Although much of Italy had joined the rebel cause, many cities remained loyal to Rome, specifically the Greek cities that dotted the Italian coastline. This, combined with Rome's maintained dominance over the road system, meant that they could bring reinforcements in from the provinces. And during this second year of the social war, Sulla continued to go around the Bay of Naples taking out rebel strongholds, at one point joining up with a naval legate called Aulus Albinus to besiege the city of Pompeii. During this siege, an interesting chapter would play out which would exemplify the way that the Roman army had changed since the reforms of Gaius Marius a few decades earlier. Albinus's troops, having some kind of grievance with their commander, murdered him. Sulla, who always maintained an easygoing rapport with his own men, responded in an uncharacteristically lenient fashion. He just goes like, ah, well, you know, they're good lads, really. They're good soldiers. I'm sure they regret what they've done. 
You know, they, it's really not like them to be like this. And you know, they're, they're probably going to feel so guilty about it, I'll bet they'll fight extra hard and extra bravely in the coming battles. Why did Sulla let Albinus's men off the hook? Was it perhaps that he secretly didn't care for Albinus and was maybe a little bit glad that he was gone? Maybe he was being honest, maybe he really did see an opportunity to exalt his men to great deeds and victory by guilt-tripping them. Or maybe Sulla was concerned that perhaps if he pushed too hard, his men might do the same thing to him. Either way, this is the beginning of a long Roman tradition of soldiers murdering their commanders and getting away with it. Anyways, after taking Pompeii, Sulla marches east into Samnium. The people of this region, the Samnites, were traditional enemies of the Romans. In their distant past, they'd fought multiple wars against each other, and the Samnites defeated the Romans horribly on multiple occasions, which meant that they had a real reputation as being fierce soldiers. So when Sulla crushed them and seized their capital at Bovianum, he returned to Rome a Roma hero, the man who had destroyed the Samnite menace. In reality, Sulla's campaign against the Samnites was not that consequential when it came to the Roman victory in the social war. The real victory was less glamorous and took place on the floor of the Senate House. Lucius Julius Caesar, Sulla's old commander, had returned to Rome with a plan to defeat the rebels once and for all. Not with the sword, but with the pen or the stylus, I suppose. He composed a law, the Lex Julia, which offered citizenship to any Italians who would remain loyal during the rebellion, and anyone who surrendered immediately. This was quickly followed by two more laws, which further expanded Italian citizenship rights. With the offer of peace in front of them, and what most of them had been asking for all along, Loads of Italians took the deal. Ironically, the Romans won the war, which they had started by being immovable on the subject of Italian citizenship, by conceding Italian citizenship. But despite this being the real cause of the Roman victory, Sulla could still style himself as the hero of the hour by winning more glamorous and conventional victories in battle. So he returned to Rome, divorced his wife so he could marry a more politically advantageous woman, and ran for the consulship of 88 BCE. And won! Sulla had finally done it. He was consul. He had restored his family's fortunes. From an impoverished youth crawling the streets of Rome with the lowest of the low, to the highest magistracy in the land. To rise so high was obvious proof that he was, in fact, Felix, Sulla the Lucky. And there was one main reason that Sulla really wanted this consulship. The ruler of a small Anatolian kingdom called Pontus, one Mithridates VI, had styled himself Liberator of the Greeks. When the social war had broken out, Mithridates had taken the opportunity to blast through Rome's eastern provinces, killing all Romans he found in his wake and his new empire now bore down on Greece. This was great news to many Romans. A new war would mean so much to them. To the regular soldiers, this was a chance to get out there and do some plundering. Anatolia was one of the richest places in the ancient world, and the opportunity to pillage it was just too good to pass up on. And to the Roman elite, this war would mean glory and legacy. Fighting their own allies was unglamorous, no one really liked doing it, and barbarian tribes were barbarian tribes. But a wealthy eastern king, the descendant of Alexander the Great, an inheritor of the legacy of the mighty Persian Empire, whoever beat that guy would get a statue built of him for sure. And Sulla, the new consul, a talented commander and proven soldier, was top of the list of potential candidates. But he was not the only candidate. Gaius Marius had been eyeing this job for some time. In fact, he was dead set on being the guy to command Roman armies against Mithridates. So much so that it's possible he even helped orchestrate the war in the first place. Mithridates had been kind of provoked into war by Rome's agents in Anatolia, most of which were clients of Gaius Marius. Marius had even met the king at one point and told him that he should either seek to be stronger than Rome or do her bidding which sound like fighting words to me. Gaius Marius was convinced that the job should be his. After all, he was the greatest Roman commander in living history. He had invented the modern professional legions, and he was often called the third founder of Rome. 
Who else deserves such a prestigious job? Well, quite a lot of people as it turned out. Sure, the Roman people loved Gaius Marius and they were grateful to him for his many years of service. But he was almost 70 years old, he was overweight and, according to some rumours, a little bit senile. He was in no fit state to command Rome's armies anymore. But Marius would not accept this. He would prove that he was still the man that he had always been. Every day, Marius made his way down to the Campus Martius and put himself through a gruelling exercise routine. Running, jumping and doing bodyweight exercises alongside younger men to show that he could still keep up, pushing his body to the limit. And this provoked three broad reactions from the onlookers. Quite a few were fairly impressed at the sight of this old man losing weight and getting back into fighting shape. But many thought that it was just a bit sad. Plutarch tells us that the better part of the onlookers were moved to pity at the sight of his greed and ambition, because though he had risen from poverty to the greatest wealth, and from obscurity to the highest place, he knew not how to set bounds on his good fortune, and was not content to be admired and enjoy quietly what he had. And some openly mocked him. Ever insensitive as the Romans were, they laughed at the sight of this decrepit old man struggling to do push-ups. Why are you doing this, they yelled at him. Go back to your baths, go back to your villa in the south of Italy, and stop making a fool of yourself. Predictably, the Senate, many of whom had always kind of resented Marius, gave the job to Sulla, like they were always going to. Sure, it was impressive that Marius could still run and jump around at his age, but the real war was not going to be decided in the gym. It was being decided in the Senate House and in the Legionary Camps, which is where Sulla was and where Marius was not. Marius's career was done. Sure, he had saved Rome from an invasion and served as consul six times, but that was like 15 years ago. It was time for him to step aside and let the younger guys have a go. So Sulla started preparing for his campaign. Finally, he could leave the politics and the petty squabbles of Rome behind and go off and fight a nice, simple war. Except he couldn't, because of course he couldn't. The issue of the Italian question reared its ugly head again. Sure, all of the Italians were citizens now, but how exactly they would participate in Roman politics was still kind of up in the air. The Romans voted in tribes. Members of each tribe would cast their vote and come to a tribal decision. And all of these decisions were then collected together, and that's how elections were done. Sometimes. Probably. So how would the Italians be brought into this system? Would they be integrated into the existing tribes, or would new tribes be made for them? And if so, how many new tribes? These were the big questions that would surely shape the course of Roman politics for generations to come. And when Sulla was preparing to march off to war, this was still very much an open question. Enter a new populist tribune, Publius Sulpicius Rufus, the new champion of Italian voting rights and a stalwart ally of Gaius Marius. And Sulpicius immediately started stirring things up in Rome. Appian tells us, Sulpicius encouraged the newly enfranchised Italian citizens, who were discriminated against in the voting procedure, to hope that they would be distributed in all the tribes. Sulpicius forthwith proposed a law on the subject, which, if passed, would bring about everything that he and Marius wanted, since the new citizens far outnumbered the old. But the latter realised this, and strenuously opposed the new citizens. They fought each other with clubs and stones. The social war was not over yet, no matter how much Sulla really wanted it to be. Sulpicius's proposal had caused rioting in the streets of Rome. In a move that I think betrays just how much Sulla really didn't want to get bogged down in a lengthy debate about Italian citizenship, he and his fellow consul, Quintus Pompeius, simply shut the whole thing down. They declared a suspension of public business. No political dealings could be done as long as this suspension held. Now, ostensibly, it was for a religious festival, but everyone knew that they just wanted to delay voting on the Italian suffrage bill. And it did not work. Sulpicius, who was outraged, 
marched into the forum at the head of hundreds of supporters, all of whom were armed, and he publicly denounced the cessation of public business as illegal. The crowd then drew their weapons and threatened to kill both consuls if voting did not commence immediately. And this really frightened both Sulla and Pompeius, and they slipped away as quietly as they could, seeing how dangerous the situation was. But they didn't slip away easily. Pompeius' own son, who stood up for his father in front of the crowd, was stabbed to death on the spot. Sulla, who despite holding such a high magistracy, was now running through the streets of Rome fearing for his life, fled to the only place that he could, the house of Gaius Marius. Nobody knows what transpired between Marius and Sulla in that house. We don't even really know what the true nature of their relationship at this point was. Was their rivalry an open one, or was it still kept firmly behind closed doors? Did Marius personally resent Sulla, or was this rivalry purely political? Did Sulla feel the same way about Marius? And did Sulla have any idea that Marius had been secretly working with Sulpicius this whole time? We can only say two things for sure. Firstly, that this was the last time that Marius and Sulla were ever in the same room together. And secondly, whatever was said, Sulla left the house of Marius, went into the forum, and publicly ended the suspension of public business. Sulla then left Rome immediately and raced south. This latest humiliation had been almost too much for him. He just wanted to get to his army, sail east, and start fighting this damn war already. But alas, it was not to be. No sooner had Sulla arrived in his camp and started making preparations for war, than an envoy arrived bearing a troubling message. In Sulla's absence, Sulpicius had passed his law on Italian citizenship. With one additional caveat, Marius would replace Sulla as commander in the Mithridatic War. Sulla was now faced with a choice. If he did as he was commanded, this would be the final humiliation to end his political career. Everything he had achieved in his 50 years of life would mean nothing because his legacy would be reduced to that of a man who had served a short, embarrassingly unsuccessful magistracy before being driven from power. A bit like Liz Truss. But the alternative? Well, what was the alternative? Appeal to the Senate? The Senate were cowering before Sulpicius' street gangs. So Sulla addressed his soldiers. He told them about how he had been tricked out of the command by Marius, about the violence that had been threatened against him in Rome, and then he told them something that cut deep into the fear of each one of his legionaries. He told them that Marius planned to disband them and use his own soldiers for the war in the east. This last claim was something that Sulla had no evidence for, and it's very unlikely Marius would have actually done this. But it had a real effect on his soldiers. Men who were recruited from the urban poor and the landless of Italy, who saw this war as an opportunity to enrich themselves, and saw that opportunity fly away at the prospect of a Marian command. Sulla gave them no instructions, but told them to be ready to obey orders when the time came. Not long after, two tribunes, young officers, real junior guys, came into the camp to officially relieve Sulla of his command. They didn't get very far because Sulla's men stoned them to death before they could get to him. And the first blood of Rome's first civil war had been shed. The two tribunes were quickly followed by two praetors, high-ranking Roman magistrates. They were taken by Sulla's men, stripped naked, beaten, and sent back to the city of Rome with nothing. The gloves were now off. But what was happening was unprecedented. Was Sulla really going to use his army to achieve his own political ends? Would he really set his own soldiers against his own countrymen? To do something like that would be an act of terrible sacrilege. Sulla in his own mind, was only in the position that he was in because of the favour of the Roman gods. Would he continue to enjoy that favour if he brought violence against his fellow citizens? Sulla's army, as he saw, being eager to march at once against the city, although he himself wavered in his own mind and feared the danger. But after he had offered a sacrifice, Postumius, the soothsayer, learned what the omens were, and stretching out both hands to Sulla, begged that he might be bound and kept a prisoner until the battle, assuring him that he was willing to undergo the extremest penalty if things did not speedily come to a good issue for him. 
It is said also that to Sulla himself there appeared in his dreams a goddess whom the Romans learned to worship from the Cappadocians, whether she is Luna or Minerva or Bellona. This goddess, as Sulla fancied, stood by his side and put into his hand a thunderbolt, and naming his enemies one by one, bade him smite them with it, and they were all smitten and fell and vanished away. Encouraged by the vision, he told it to his colleagues and at break of day led on towards Rome. And so Lucius Cornelius Sulla, at the head of six legions, turned north and became the first Roman in history to march against his own city. Now, to do such a thing was so unthinkable in the minds of the Romans that Sulla did not blame his officers and staff one bit when they all refused to join him. All except one, that is, who was a young caster by the name of Lucius Lucullus. As Sulla approached Rome, he was met by yet another deputation from the city, and they asked him in pleading tones why he, a good citizen, a lawful man, and a patrician nonetheless, was marching armed men against his own country. Sulla responded coldly, to deliver her from tyrants. It's pretty obvious that no one expected that Sulla would break the sacred laws and traditions of Mos Maiorum and march on the city of Rome. And we can see this in how utterly pathetic Marius's response was. Marius could command the loyalty of tens of thousands of veterans and Italians, but he had no hope of rallying them in time to face Sulla. So in desperation, he offered freedom to any slave that would join him in the fight. Sulpicius could call on his political street gangs, a group of a few hundred thugs called the Anti-Senate. These guys had been terrifying in Rome itself, and fears of their violent retribution and their threats had basically decided Roman politics over the last few weeks. But Sulla was marching at the head of six legions, professional and well-armed killers. Sulpicius's gangs had been great for intimidating unarmed voters and senators, but they would be no match for Sulla's army. Marius's offer to free any slaves that joined him turned out a pitiful three new recruits. The slaves weren't stupid, they knew that Sulla was coming with his army. If they took up Marius's offer, they would enjoy their freedom for like an hour, maybe two, Hell, maybe six hours of freedom before being brutally butchered by a legionary. And then it happened. The first of Sulla's legionaries appeared at the Esquiline Gate and forced their way into the city. At first, the only resistance came from the scattered street gangs of Sulpicius, who were quickly dispatched by Sulla's men. Then, the populace of the city began pelting the legionaries with rocks and stones. Sulla, who had always said that the best decisions were made in the spur of the moment, flew into a fury. He ordered that his archers set light to their arrows and burn the people of Rome out. He galloped to the front of his men, torch in hand, and led them as they set the Esquiline Hill ablaze. This he did not from any calm calculation, but in a passion, and having surrendered to his anger the command over his actions, since he thought only of his enemies, and without any regard or even pity for friends, kindred, and relations, made his entry by the aid of fire, which made no distinction between the guilty and the innocent. Seeing that all was lost, Marius, Sulpicius, and their allies tried to flee the city. Marius and his son got out okay, but Sulpicius was betrayed by one of his slaves and murdered. When he saw that Sulpicius was dead, Sulla freed the slave that had murdered him as a thank you for his service. He then had the freed slave thrown from the Tarpian rock and killed as a punishment for having betrayed his master. However, once it was clear that Marius was gone and the city was his, Sulla dialed back the brutality a little bit. He didn't sleep for his first night in Rome. Instead, he was up until dawn, galloping up and down the Via Sacra, reining his men in and punishing those who he found looting. In the morning, Sulla called a meeting of the Senate. He had just committed one of the worst, one of the most unthinkably sacrilegious crimes in all of Roman history. And he had his work cut out for him, convincing everyone that he wasn't a traitor or an enemy of the Roman people. He had meant it, when he said he was marching on the city to free her from tyrants. So he granted a general amnesty to anyone who had wronged him or fought for Marius the day before. All except for 12. There were 12 individuals that Sulla felt had to be put to death because they were enemies of the state. Marius, obviously. Marius's son, also called Marius, 
and Sulpicius, who was already dead, along with nine others. These guys were labelled traitors. They could be killed on sight, and harbouring them or providing them with aid was tantamount to treason. Sulla then told the Senate that he planned to fix Rome, to bring the city back to its roots, and to make sure that nothing like this would ever be necessary again. Since the tribunate of Tiberius Gracchus, Roman politics had been split between two broad ideologies. On one side you had the populares, and on the other, the optimates. Tiberius Gracchus was like the OG populare. He started a tradition of Roman politicians circumventing the traditional institutions of the Republic and appealing to the urban poor for their power. The optimates, by contrast, believed in the rights of Roman aristocrats and nobles to dominate Roman politics through the institution of the Senate. Now, I know it might be tempting to look at the populares and the optimates and equate them with modern political parties, to see the populares as being like left-wing and the optimates as being like right-wing. But it's important that we don't see things through that lens. The Roman Republic didn't have political parties, nothing close to the kind that most modern democracies have. Being an optimate or a populare actually had quite little to do with policy. It was far less to do with what powerful men did with their power, and more to do with how they acquired it. A populare became influential by courting the poor of Rome, whilst an optimate gained their influence by courting the rich and the aristocrats. Marius, who had never really been liked by Rome's aristocracy, aligned himself with the populares, often to his own detriment, whilst Sulla, a conservative at heart, was an optimate. In Sulla's fairly conservative opinion, the populare politics of Rome were the reason he had had to march on the city. Ever since Tiberius Gracchus had convinced the urban plebs that they were being treated unfairly somehow, they'd been under the bizarre impression that their opinion mattered. And this was no good in Sulla's mind. Rome needed to return to being more like its ancient and more noble past, when political decisions were pretty much entirely in the hands of a small, aristocratic and wealthy elite, who were, of course, the best qualified for the job. So Sulla strengthened the Senate, which was the centre of aristocratic power in Rome, by promoting 300 equestrians to the order and swelling its ranks. He also gutted the tribunate of its powers. The tribune of the plebs was a magistracy designed to protect the people against the abuses of aristocratic power, but in Sulla's mind it had been using its power to instead push the interests of the people, which was a step too far. And so this is how Sulla returned Rome to its natural form, its roots, the way things had always been before the Gracchi came along and ruined everything. The fact that this mythical golden age where Rome was an enlightened republic run by patriotic and noble oligarchs had never existed, but was just a product of aristocratic imagination, didn't bother Sulla at all. This was how things would be done from here on out. Sulla also doesn't seem to have been bothered at all by the hypocrisy of this whole thing. The fact that he was returning Rome to its most sacred traditions after having broken the most sacred tradition by marching on the city. But that wasn't lost on the regular people. Whatever you think of Sulla at this point, I think one thing can be said for sure, which is that he wasn't grasping for pure tyrannical power. I think in his mind, he was genuinely fixing Rome's problems. And you can kind of see this in what happens next. With so many empty vacancies in the magistracies of Rome caused by the chaos of the last few weeks, he held elections and he threw his support behind his optimate friends, including his own nephew. And Rome rejected Sulla. Probably influenced by his controversial march on the city, they voted against his preferred candidate. His nephew lost his election to, of all people, the nephew of Gaius Marius. One of the new consuls, a man called Cinna, was a stalwart enemy of Sulla's, an outspoken populare who ran on a promise of prosecuting Sulla when he returned from the war. The second consul to be elected, Octavius, was an optimate, but still no friend of Sulla's. And Sulla didn't say a word against this. 
If that was the people's will, that was the people's will. He would not contest the election. Say what you want about Sulla at this point. He isn't a tyrant. He's not just after power, even if that's how he comes across. All Sulla wanted to do was leave Rome in a peaceful and stable state so that he could go off and fight his war. So in aid of that, he made the new consuls swear an oath that they would uphold his laws. And then he went off to join his army and finally get out of here. But the Rome that Sulla was leaving behind was not peaceful. The two chief magistrates were ideologically and personally opposed to one another. In the south, the Samnites were continuing to stoke the embers of the social war, and Italy was full of young, ambitious and radical men, just waiting for an opportunity to pounce on their enemies. And Gaius Marius was still at large. Gaius Marius, the man who on more than one occasion had ridden through the streets of Rome in triumph and parade as the people cheered him as their saviour, was on the run, declared an enemy of the state and sentenced to death. He sat on a beach in southern Italy, waiting for Sulla's men to find him. Then he spotted two vessels sailing offshore, and without hesitating, Marius dove into the water and began to swim for his life. What few companions he had left began to swim after him. Possibly because, like him, he saw these ships as their only hope of escape, or possibly because Marius, who was almost 70 years old and pretty overweight, promptly began to drown. So two of the brigade go after Marius, rescue him, help him tread water to one of the vessels and get him aboard, while the rest swim for the other boat, and no sooner are they safe on board than Sulla's horsemen appear on the beach. The horsemen called out to the sailors, We know you've got Gaius Marius, hand him over now, either bring him to shore or just, I don't know, throw him overboard, we don't care which. And Marius, seeing that the sailors were considering this offer, fell to his knees and began weeping, pleading for them to please take him somewhere safe. The sailors agree to help Marius. His companions are taken to an island just off the shore, whilst Marius himself takes one of the ships further south. After not too long, Marius' ship pulls into the mouth of a river, and the captain explains to him, saying, look, we have to stop and weigh anchor for a little while. It's going to be a few hours at least before the tide turns and we can catch some favourable winds further. You're an old man, it's going to be a long journey. I think it's for the best if you disembark and rest for a little while. Marius, who had been through quite a lot that day, decides that dinner and a nap would actually probably do him some good. So he disembarks and lies down on the beach. But as soon as Marius was beyond dashing distance from the vessel, the captain ordered that the anchor be raised, the sails let down, and he went off into the distance. Marius was left completely alone, sitting on a beach in the middle of nowhere. According to Plutarch, Marius just kind of sat there for a little while, contemplating just how badly his week had gone. Not too long ago, Sulla had fled to his house to escape the riots of Sulpicius, and now that same man who had begged him for help had declared him an outlaw, had men all over the country looking for him, and was off commanding his army. But once the shock had worn off, Marius stood up, dusted off his clothes, and began making his way inland. He avoided roads or well-used paths and instead trudged along the banks of the river Lyrus until he came across a small shack. In this shack lived an old man who did not recognise Marius. Marius, who was a guy who at this point in his life was not used to not being recognised, had to explain to this man why he was important and why he should help him. The old man, who seemed wholly unbothered by this so-called great Roman general, was just like, yeah, sure, you can sleep here if you like, and if people really are hunting you, just dip into the river and hide there. So Marius hid, covered by reeds in the bank of the river, and he hid there for hours until he heard horsemen come by and enter the shack of the old man, where they began to interrogate him. Marius could hear them raise their voices. We know that you're harboring enemies of the state. Give them up. Realising that the game was up, Marius stood up, revealed himself, threw his clothes off, and dived into the muddy waters of the river Lyris. This was the second time that day that Marius had thrown himself into a large body of liquid hoping to escape, and this time went even worse than the last. Despite his best attempts to get away and hide himself, Marius was discovered and dragged unwillingly and naked and filthy out of the river. 
he was then marched as a prisoner to the nearby town of Minturni. Marius now found himself as the reluctant prisoner of some pretty reluctant jailers. I mean, yeah, sure, the order had gone out that Marius should be killed or captured on sight, and anyone who harboured him was a traitor. But this was Gaius Marius. This guy had been consul six times. He had defended Italy from the invading Cimbri and the Teutones, and he had always championed Italian rights, and it was those very Italians who were now holding him prisoner. But eventually, they decided that risking the wrath of Rome was simply not worth it. They sent an assassin into Gaius Marius' room to dispatch him. The assassin, funnily enough, was said to be of Cimbric origin, meaning that he was probably brought to Italy as a slave after Gaius Marius had decimated his people 15 years earlier. He made his way into the house that Marius was being detained at, drew his sword, and opened the door. The room was dark, and the general appeared to be sleeping. The assassin crept towards him quietly. It would be better to dispatch a man like this while he was unconscious. But then, suddenly, the sleeping figure shot upright. In the darkness, his eyes seemed to light on fire and became the only visible thing in the room. In the booming voice of a man used to yelling commands over the din of battle, the old general shook the room when he turned to his would-be killer and said, You man, do you dare kill Gaius Marius? Terrified, the assassin ran from the house into the street, threw down his sword and screamed, I cannot do it. I cannot kill Gaius Marius. This shook the locals. Clearly, killing Gaius Marius was not a good idea. After all, he had only served six of his seven prophesied consulships. The gods had plans for this man, and these small-time Italians weren't about to get in their way. Unwilling to either kill him or give him sanctuary, the people of Minturni took Marius to the coast, put him on a boat filled with supplies, and just sent him off. So, Marius was adrift, yet again. Without much direction, he sailed south. He tried to dock at Sicily, but was intercepted by a Roman caestor and narrowly avoided capture. Marius then made his way to the province of Africa. He had fought a war there over two decades ago, his first war as a commander-in-chief. A fair few of his old soldiers could still be found there. Surely they would give him sanctuary. Marius pulled up near the ruins of the city of Carthage. As he disembarked, he was met immediately by a local official, with a note from the governor. It read, Sextilius the governor forbids you, Marius, to set foot in Africa. And if you disobey, he declares that he will uphold the decrees of the Senate and treat you as an enemy of Rome. Marius simply stared at the official. For a long time, the two men stood face to face in silence. Eventually, the messenger asked Marius if he had a response for the governor. Marius quietly groaned, Tell him, you have seen Gaius Marius a fugitive, seated amid the ruins of Carthage. An apt comparison. Carthage had once ruled the Western Mediterranean as a mighty empire and ranked amongst the greatest cities on earth. Now, thanks to the Romans, Carthage was a depopulated ruin, the charred and dilapidated streets standing testament to the brutality of Roman ways. Marius himself had once been a leader of Rome and, like Carthage, was now a mere shadow of his former self. So Marius got back on his ship and sailed about 200 miles west along the coast of North Africa. Here, he met with the new king of Numidia. Ironically, Marius, who had made his career fighting the Numidians, found that very same people were the only ones willing to provide him sanctuary, though Marius never really felt safe amongst them. It was here, however, that the old general's luck began to turn. He discovered that his son, who had been separated from him soon after fleeing Rome, had actually survived. And so the elder Gaius Marius, now 70, and Gaius Marius the younger, only 24, were reunited. Father and son embraced each other, and they started exchanging stories and rumours from Italy. It was said that Sulla, after marching on Rome, had held new elections, and then left with his army for Greece to fight Mithridates. And the city had been left in the hands of two rival consuls, Octavius the Optimate, loyal to Sulla, and Cinna, the Populare, loyal to Marius. When Sulla had finally left Italy, the two consuls began to fight, and Octavius had successfully driven Cinna from Rome. But the Marians were not beaten. Octavius held Rome, but Cinna had gone into the countryside and started rallying the Italians to his cause. He planned to retake the city, and all he needed was a famous general to come and lead the army for him. Marius's time was at hand. 
So he gathered together a group of disaffected Italians, raised some money to hire some Numidian mercenaries, and set sail for Italy and his triumphant return. When Marius returned to Italy, he found a country awash in violence. Sulla's departure had left no single force in the peninsula as clearly dominant. Consequently, everyone was angling for power. Octavius controlled Rome. Cinna was raising troops in Campania, and other Roman armies still scattered the landscape, snuffing out the last remnants of the social war. Marius shifted the balance of power by landing in Etruria, where he had always been popular. He was from northern Italian provincial stock himself. He had saved these people from the Cimbri about two decades ago, and he had always fought for their rights. So when a tired, unshaven Marius returned from exile, 6,000 Etrurians rushed to join his small force. He then marched south to join Cinna outside Rome, where the two men promptly cut the city off from its food supply. Octavius refused to yield the city, but the Senate was pretty concerned about the famine and the possibility of violence breaking out if it got worse, so they sent out a delegation to their besiegers. They were greeted by Cinna, sitting in his consular chair, and Gaius Marius by his side. The Senate asked Cinna to please swear an oath, promising that he would not initiate a general massacre when he entered the city. But Cinna had all the negotiating power here, he refused to swear any oaths. He kind of non-committedly said, Ah, oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to intentionally massacre anyone, but I can't guarantee the safety of my political enemies, if you know what I'm saying. All the while, Marius remained silent, staring at the delegation with those fiery eyes of his. The Senate, who really didn't have any choice in the matter, decided to let the Marians in. But before entering the city, Marius stopped for a little bit of theatre. Marius halted at the gates of the city and said he would go no further. After all, he was a good, law-abiding citizen, and the law said that he was exiled from the city. He wouldn't break a law like that, would he? And the tribunes hurried into Rome and quickly revoked Marius's exile. So Marius, Cinna, and all of their men entered the city of Rome and washed it in blood. Octavius, the optimate consul who had driven Cinna from Rome, was the first on the hit list. When he heard that Marius and Cinna had returned, he donned his toga and the insignia of his consulship and made his way to the centre of the city, as if he was about to receive a foreign dignitary. Octavius' friends knew that there would be no mercy, and they begged him to flee while he still could. One of them even brought him his horse and was like, here, just get on this and go. No one will judge you for it. Just get out of here. But Octavius refused. He was consul. He was elected by the people of Rome to represent Rome, and he would not abandon the city. So he remained sat there, surrounded by the insignia of his high office, until Marius's men found him and beheaded him. With Octavius dead and the city his, Marius unleashed a wave of revenge killings. Sulla's friends, Sulla's associates, Sulla's family, hell, people who were unlucky enough to be seen in the same room at Sulla at the wrong time, all of them were marked for death. Trials, appeals, those were all a thing of the past. All it took to kill someone was a word from Marius. Or even a lack of a word. One senator was killed because he waved at Marius in the street, and Marius did not wave back. Some got away. One particularly cunning example was set by a man who procured a corpse, somehow. He had his slaves build a funeral pyre for it, and then he removed his senatorial ring and placed it on the corpse's finger. When Marius's men approached, the slaves set fire to the cadaver and explained that they were cremating their master, who had sadly hanged himself when he found out that Marius was after him. Look! He was burning whilst he still wore his ring. Marius's men bought the story and left. This one man survived, but most would not. Marcus Antonius, a famous orator, knew that Marius was out for his head, so he found refuge with a friend of his who lived in the poor part of the city. But this friend wasn't used to having a famous Roman noble in his house, and was embarrassed to see him eating stale bread and drinking cheap wine. The man sent his slave to a local inn to purchase a finer vintage, but the innkeeper was suspicious to hear that this man, who always bought the cheap stuff, was suddenly wanting some expensive wine. The innkeeper reported 
of the incident to Marius' men, who raided the house and killed Antonius. One of the coldest moments of Marius' purge happened when his old colleague, Quintus Lutatius Catullus, came to speak with Marius. These men had shared command of the Kimbrick War, worked together for years, and even celebrated triumphs together. But that was probably why Catullus was on Marius's hit list. He had dared to try and share the spotlight. Therefore, when Catullus begged Marius for his life, the old general looked at him unmoved and simply said, you must die. Catullus promptly went home and did the job himself. Eventually, the killing subsided. Although in one final act of horrific brutality, Marius had to kill off his own mercenaries to prevent them from continuing the violence. And then, on New Year's Day, 86 BCE, Cinna and Marius were elected consuls of Rome. Marius had done it. His prophesied seventh consulship was his. However, the seventh consulship of Marius would not be remembered as his triumph. Rather, it would be remembered as the tragic final chapter in his turbulent life. Not long after being sworn in, news arrived from the east. Sulla, who had gotten bogged down in a grueling siege of the city of Athens, was finally bringing the war with Mithridates to a close. It wouldn't be long before he came home, and he would probably bring his army with him. Plutarch paints a picture of Marius at this point as a man crippled by fears and anxieties. He's kept awake every night by vivid nightmares of Sulla's return, in which he supposedly heard a booming voice saying, Dreadful indeed is the lion's lair, even though it is empty. The lion would return any day now. And then what? So Marius spent the first seven days of his consulship drinking heavily in an attempt to subdue his anxious thoughts and just get some sleep. Then he fell ill and went to bed, never to rise again. He spent ten days in utter delirium, under the impression that he was in Anatolia, commanding an army against Mithridates. Plutarch tells us, So fierce and inexorable was the passion for directing that war which had been instilled into him by his envy and lust of power. And therefore, though he had lived to be seventy years old, and was the first man to be elected consul for the seventh time, and was possessed of a house and wealth which would have sufficed for many kingdoms at once, he lamented his fortune, in that he was dying before he had satisfied and completed his desires. And so, Gaius Marius died. 17 days into his long prophesied 7th consulship, having never gone face to face with Sulla. Marius was dead, and this guy Cinna was now in charge. We don't really know much about Cinna, unlike Marius or Sulla, he doesn't seem to have this long elaborate backstory, he kind of just appears out of historical thin air. He may have been a big shot in Roman politics, but he certainly didn't have the same sway over the army that Marius had, and that becomes obvious as soon as Marius dies. With the old general gone, Cinna raises his ally, Gnaeus Papirius Carbo, as his co-consul, and together they scheme to do Sulla in once and for all. Cinna decides to depart as soon as possible, to cross over to Greece and fight Sulla in foreign territory. A good idea? Yeah, maybe. But Cinna was in such a rush to get out of Italy that he didn't wait for spring, and with it, reliable sailing conditions. He decides to send his army off in three divisions. The first crosses the Adriatic and lands in Epirus, relatively incident-free. The second is caught up in a vicious winter storm and is wrecked, with the survivors washing up in tatters on the Greek shore. Cinna's men, seeing the carnage about them that had been wrecked by Mother Nature herself, took a deep breath, looked around, decided that they'd made a good enough go of it, and all went home. Seeing two-thirds of his army disintegrate before they'd even seen the enemy, Cinna went into an absolute fury. He stood up and began berating his remaining soldiers. And they stabbed him. And that was the end of Cinna. Okay, so ever since he departed Italy for his war, we've kind of been ignoring what Sulla's been up to. We know what's happened in Rome, three years of chaos, Marius is exiled, Marius returns, bloody purge, the whole lot. But this video is about Sulla, so what's been happening with our guy whilst Rome has been in chaos? Well mostly, he's been doing what he always intended to do, which is to fight Mithridates. 
And he's been doing pretty well. You know, it's been slow progress. It's taken a few years. But the Romans are finally pushing the king back into Asia. This war between King Mithridates VI and the Empire of Rome is a very interesting one and an important chapter in Sulla's life. But I'm going to ignore it entirely for three reasons. First of all, this video is already long enough. Secondly, this story already has a lot of moving parts in it and a diversion into the Pontic Empire and its conflict with Rome is only going to make it more confusing. And thirdly, I'm going to save all that content for a future video about Mithridates. All that we need to know for our purposes is that Sulla won the war and in 85 BCE he signed a peace treaty with Mithridates and began the march back to Italy. The profits from his army's looting and the indemnities paid to him by the cities that surrendered to Sulla were all he needed to finance his return. But what would actually happen when he returned to Italy was still quite uncertain. He was unpopular with the Italians. Marius had whipped up a fury against him. Would the entire peninsula rise and oppose him? He didn't want to have to fight his way through his home country as if he were some conquering hero. And his army? Like, would his army do that? Would they march on their own country again? Or would they get back to Italy with the riches that they plundered from the east and decide that now was a good time to just go home? So Sulla started stacking the odds in his favour. He wrote a letter back to Rome boasting of his achievements in the Mithridatic War, how he had defeated Rome's enemies, and then asking in outraged tones why his reward for bringing victory to the Roman people was to see his property confiscated and his friends murdered. He also had his men swear a quick oath that they would stay with him when they returned to Italy and not just abandon him. And then perhaps most crucially, he promised to not seek revenge against the Italians or any other citizens. His grievances were with a select group of Roman politicians. No one else had any reason to fear him. This massively undercut support for the Marians. Cinna had likely cultivated a little bit of a fear that when Sulla returned, being a staunch optimate, he would try and roll back Italian rights. But Sulla was a practical man. Sure, he had his own beliefs, that he didn't think the Italians should be citizens, and he thought that Roman power should come from the aristocracy and the nobility. But he also understood that there is a vast difference between trying to prevent someone from getting more rights and trying to take those rights away after they have already been won. The genie was out of the bottle. Italian citizenship and enfranchisement was here to stay. Sulla was not about to risk his survival over one small aspect of his ideology. With his business in the East concluded, Sulla sailed back to Italy in the spring of 83 BCE. He landed in the port town of Brundisium and possibly expected some resistance. But the people of the town welcomed him with open arms and Sulla, as a display of gratitude, granted them a tax exemption which they would enjoy for centuries to come. So now with Sulla back in Italy, it's civil war time, and that means it's time to pick a side. With Marius and Cinna both dead, their cause was championed by a new crew. So let's introduce the Marians. In charge, we have Gnaeus Papirius Carbo, a seasoned popolare, an old friend of Cinna's. He is now the de facto leader. Joining him and lending some legitimacy to his cause is Marius' son, Gaius Marius the Younger. He's only in his mid-twenties, but he nevertheless acts as the successor to his father's legacy. We have Gaius Norbanus, another popolare, Scipio Asiaticus, the unimpressive heir to one of Rome's greatest families, and finally Quintus Sertorius, an outspoken and independently minded military officer. When Sulla landed in Italy, he was joined by his own crew of loyal supporters, the first of which is Metellus Pius. He came from an extremely prominent family. His father had made an enemy of Marius and been exiled as a result. Rome being a family business, the young Metellus had fought his father's cause so fervently that he got the nickname Pius. Marcus Licinius Crassus, a young nobleman who had been forced into hiding after Marius had murdered his father and older brother, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, a young man called Gnaeus Pompey. Pompey's father had died and left his 23-year-old son with a massive network of clients and a huge inheritance. When Sulla landed, Pompey used these resources to raise a personal army. Nobody thought that Pompey, who was at least 20 years too young to lead an army, would get very far. However, 
However, Pompey turned out to be a brilliant and ambitious young strategist, who defeated or outmaneuvered every army sent to stop him from joining with Sulla. When he arrived in the south, Sulla indulged the massive ego of this young Wunderkind by hailing him as Imperator. The teams are decided, the battle lines are drawn, time for a civil war. Sulla marched north to Campania, where he met the army of Gaius Norbanus. In this first battle, Sulla utterly destroyed the Marians, sending them fleeing back towards Capua. As he pursued them, he was met by the army of Scipio, guarding the road north. Something interesting happens here. Scipio is pretty reluctant to go into actual decisive battle against Sulla's veteran legionaries, and Sulla doesn't really want to come across like this conquering warmonger in his own country. So both sides settle for an armistice. But during the armistice, Sulla encouraged his own men to mingle with Scipios. They walked up to the enemy camp carefree, shared drinks with them, shared meals, played dice, and all the time Sulla's men gently steered the conversations towards how great their commander was. Oh, Sulla. Oh, Sulla. Yeah, he's a great guy. I've loved working for him. Look how rich I am. All of this treasure? I got that fighting in the east with Sulla. You know, I bet he'd love it if you guys surrendered. He'd probably treat you so nicely. He might even offer you a job. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to work for a guy who pays so well? Sulla was using the ceasefire to undermine the leadership of Scipio, who was blissfully unaware that he was losing the war while he thought he was at peace. But Scipio's second-in-command, Quintus Sertorius, knew what was happening here. He saw that the time bought for both sides by the armistice was gently swinging the scales in Sulla's favour. So one day, completely against the orders of his superiors, Sertorius took a detachment of the army and sacked a local town that had declared its loyalty to Sulla. Sulla interpreted this as a breach of the armistice, and hostilities were reignited. Fine, thought Scipio. If it's a war Sulla wants, it's a war that Sulla will get. And he lined his men up for battle. And in the cool air of the morning, the two armies approached each other, inching closer and closer together, preparing for a climactic clash. And then, as they were within earshot of each other, a great war cry thundered. Scipio likely paused for a moment as he tried to make out what it was his men were saying. And then his heart probably dropped when he realised that the great thundering war cry was in fact the sound of thousands of greetings. Thousands of men saying salve to one another as they put their weapons away and shook each other's hands. Pretty much all of Scipio's men then crossed the no man's land between the two armies and joined Sulla's side. Scipio's army had evaporated, lost without taking a single casualty. Dejected and probably in shock, Scipio went back to his tent and just kind of sat there. And he continued sitting there for a little while, until Sulla found him in his tent, and informed him that he was dismissed as commander of the army, and free to go. This was Sulla's great advantage. He was personally charismatic, he was an obviously competent leader, and he had a great rapport with the common Roman soldier. And this meant that he was just excellent at convincing people to join him, and not oppose him. Had Gaius Marius still been alive, maybe this story would have played out differently. After all, Gaius Marius also inspired an almost fanatical loyalty in his men. But Gaius Marius was dead, and none of his successors appeared up to the task. When he found out about Scipio's, frankly, pathetic defeat, Carbo remarked that there was both a lion and a fox in Sulla, and that the fox was the more vexing of the two. Carbo was going to have to try something new. As winter approached, the gap in the campaigning season gave him a chance to review his strategy and perhaps revive his fortunes. To start with, he needed a leader on his own side who was as inspiring and as impressive as Sulla was to the other side. So that year, the younger Gaius Marius, only 26 years old, was elected consul. He had done nothing of note in his life and was completely unproven in battle. But he had his father's name, and that counted for something. And the young Marius' first act as consul was to declare that all of Sulla's allies were enemies of Rome. For all that meant anymore. And then, when the spring of 82 came round, Marius the Younger marched out of Rome at the head of a massive legionary army and marched south to face Sulla. 
Sulla hears that the young Marius is marching an army against him, and he has a prophetic dream in which he sees the older Marius guiding his son to victory. So he breaks camp and starts heading towards the enemy immediately. Sulla was convinced that the battle would take place that day, but his men were exhausted. It had rained all day and they'd marched for bloody miles. After his officers pleaded with him, Sulla finally agreed that yes, they could stop and make camp for the night. However, as Sulla's men are digging ditches and building ramparts, Marius's legions appear out of nowhere. The young Marius rode at the head of his men, bravely throwing himself on Sulla's lines, giving his soldiers confidence that he truly was his father's son. However, the boldness of attacking Sulla's unprepared camp kind of backfired on the young Marius. Sulla's tired men were reinvigorated by a kind of fury at this. Attacking them whilst they were still making camp was a little bit unfair, and frankly, a bit rude. You know, this was ancient warfare, but it's still out of rules. Like, kind of. Inspired by rage and indignation at this underhanded tactic, Sulla's men threw down their shovels, picked up their swords, and began pushing Marius back. Marius's men quickly broke, and the young Marius, proving that he was not the great man that his father was, fled with them. They ran to the local town of Praenestae, where the young Marius had friends. But when Marius arrived at the gates of this friendly city, he found them solidly shut to him. The people of this place knew what was happening. They could see Sulla's men quickly approaching, and they weren't about to open their city gates to this rabble of panicking soldiers. Marius himself was hoisted up into the city by a rope, but his men were left at the foot of the walls where they continued to cry, hey please just let us in, until Sulla's men fell on them and massacred 20,000 of them, taking all the survivors prisoner. Things really did not look good for the Marians. They were weakened further by even more desertions. Sertorius, one of their key commanders, was the first to see the writing on the wall and was wholly unwilling to just hang round and watch the defeat, so he fled to Spain. Marius was now besieged inside the city of Prenestae, and this becomes the centre of the last phase of the war. Sulla and his army will try and get into the city and kill Marius, whilst Carbo and Norbanus are periodically trying to break the siege. Long story short, this continues to go badly for the Marians. Every time they raise a new army and try to send it to Prenestae's relief, that army is intercepted and destroyed by either Pompey or Metellus. Defections over to Sulla's side continue. In one particularly frightening episode, Norbanus and all of his officers are invited to a dinner at the house of one of their allies. Little do they know that this ally has switched sides to Sulla, and he massacres them in a Red Wedding-style bloodbath. Maybe I should rethink casting Ed Harris as Sulla. I think Charles Dance would also do a good job. This mass murder of his senior command really spooks Norbanus, who only survives because he happened to be too busy that night to attend the fatal dinner. Scared for his life and seeing that all was probably lost, Norbanus hopped on a ship and ran away to the island of Rhodes. With Pompey, Metellus and Crassus closing in on him and his only remaining ally being a 26-year-old trapped by himself in a small Italian town, Carbo finally decides that it's time to pack it in, and he also hops on a boat and runs away to Sicily. So that's it, right? War won. With the exception of Marius the Younger, who is holed up inside a small Italian town with no army, all of the senior Marian leadership is either dead or has run away. And this likely would have been the end if it weren't for one more thing happening. Plutarch uses a sports analogy to describe what happened next. He says that sometimes two wrestlers will go at it for ages until one emerges victorious. But then a third wrestler enters the ring and takes advantage of the fact that the champion is now tired to seize victory for himself. In the eyes of most Italians, the social war was over. They'd gotten citizenship, what they wanted, and there was no reason to carry on fighting. But there were a few who still dreamed of a day when Rome was burned to the ground and they enjoyed full independence. And having watched their enemies tear each other apart for the last few years, the Samnites and the Lucanians decided now was a great time to start a new war. Sulla heard that the Samnites had gathered a huge army, and he reacted by consolidating his troops around Prenestae, 
they would not break through his siege lines and relieve Marius no matter what. But the Samnites' goal, if ever it really was to break the siege of Prinestai, quickly changed when they saw Sulla's army there, and they bypassed it in the dead of night and started making their way towards the undefended city of Rome. Sulla was now, for the first time in a little while, on the back foot. The Samnites had gotten a big head start to him on his way to the city of Rome, and there would not be enough time for him to march his whole army after them. So in desperation, he tells a small vanguard of elite troops to grab all the supplies and weapons that they could and start dashing north towards the city. What followed was by far the closest battle of this civil war. Sulla's army, marching at lightning pace, managed to catch the Samnites right outside the walls of Rome, just near the Colline Gate, and the two armies fell on each other. There are no descriptions of clever tactics or daring manoeuvres. The battle was just a long, bloody slog. Sulla's right wing, commanded by Crassus, begins to slowly push the Samnites back, but Sulla himself, commanding the left, has a slightly harder time of it. Sulla tried to rally his men. He rode to the front of them, pulled out an image of the god Apollo, and prayed to him that they had victory that day. But it was no good. The Samnite attack was relentless, and the Romans were pushed all the way back to their camp. Sulla sat in his camp, utterly dejected, contemplating his imminent defeat, whilst what remained of his army tried desperately to hold the Samnites off. But then a messenger arrived from Crassus. As it turns out, whilst Sulla was being forced to retreat, Crassus had utterly smashed the left flank of the Samnites, and he didn't fully understand how dire his commander's position was, because he sent this messenger requesting supplies and permission to encamp. Sulla realised then that the battle was not lost. He recalled Crassus's men, rallied his own, and destroyed the remaining Samnites. And with this victory at the Colline Gate, Sulla had finally won the war. Rome was in his hands. The Samnites and Lucanians were shattered. His political enemies were refugees, exiles, and corpses, and Gaius Marius the Younger was as good as dead. Actually, Marius the Younger was dead. In the wake of the Battle of the Colline Gate, he had tried to escape Prinestai using underground tunnels, but he was discovered, and to avoid capture, he killed himself. When Sulla was presented with the young man's head, he commented, Learn to pull an oar, boy. Then you may take the helm. The war was over, but now the true horror could begin. Sulla made his way unchallenged through the streets of Rome and called a meeting of the Senate. The leading men of Rome sat terrified as Sulla addressed them, and somewhat bizarrely he started his speech by recounting all of his great achievements in the Mithridatic War several years previously. Sulla then spoke calmly about his plans to change Rome. The people, he said, would benefit from him provided they remained obedient. The Senate would have nothing to fear from him, provided they were on his side. As Sulla made his speech, screams and cries for mercy could be heard from just outside the building. The sound of thousands of Samnite prisoners being massacred in an orgy of killing basically made Sulla nearly impossible to hear. When he noticed that the cries of the dying were kind of distracting people's attention away from him, Sulla told the Senate not to worry. That sound was just some criminals receiving their just punishment on his orders. Sulla then rounded off his speech by telling the Senate that he would hunt down and kill without mercy anyone affiliated with the Marian cause after he had offered them clemency. The cutoff date he decided for this would be that time that Scipio's army defected en masse to his. Anyone who had remained loyal to the Marians after that date had missed their chance at forgiveness. But this wasn't exactly clear. Who had supported who during the years of civil war was not always obvious, and a fair few senators had somehow gotten away with remaining neutral for most of the time. One of them came forward and asked Sulla to just put them out of their misery. He didn't ask them to spare the guilty from punishment, but he did ask Sulla to spare the innocent from suspense. Sulla responded by saying, I do not yet know who is innocent and therefore who I will spare. And the senator said, well in that case, 
Tell us who is guilty. Sulla obliged. The next day, he went into the forum in the morning and posted the names of 80 men there. Those 80 men were sentenced to death. They were enemies of the state. They were to be killed on sight, and anyone caught helping them would share their fate. And 80 names isn't really that bad. I mean, sure, 80 is a great deal more than the 12 names that he had posted after his first march on Rome. But once these 80 guys were out of the way, Maybe everything would return to normal. Maybe they could put this whole sorry chapter in Roman history behind them. Those hopes were quickly dashed when the next day, Sulla went into the forum and added 220 further names to the list. By day three, the list was nearly a thousand names strong. Even more names would soon follow. Sulla's purge was widespread and designed to permanently change the face of the Roman nobility. This purge is often referred to as the Sullen prescriptions. When someone was prescribed, it didn't just mean that they were sentenced to death. It meant they were sentenced to permanent erasure. They would be killed, their property would be auctioned off, their killers would be rewarded, and their offspring would be legally barred from public life. In doing this, Sulla wiped out entire dynasties of Roman families. As always with Sulla, this was not just brutality for brutality's sake. There was a method to what he was doing here. By permanently barring the children of prescribed individuals from public life, he ensured that they would have no political career, and therefore no power to ever seek revenge on him. At the same time, the richest people in Rome were now his allies, people who he had rewarded for helping him in these prescriptions. They were hardly going to turn on him. They were only rich and powerful because of him. What were they going to do? Give it all back. However, there was a very, very dark element to this method of purging. You know, outside of the obvious horror of it all. By offering generous rewards to those who took part in it, Sulla encouraged violence to reignite across the Italian peninsula. People would often not even look at the prescription list before killing someone. Instead, they'd just dispatch a personal enemy and make up a reason afterwards. The wealthy were the easiest victims. Sulla's lieutenants, men like Crassus and Catiline, saw an opportunity here. They started fabricating reasons for treason based on whose property they wanted. Plutarch relates a story. Those who fell victim to political resentment and private hatred were as nothing compared to those who were butchered for the sake of their property. Until even the executioners were prompted to say that this fine villa killed this man, his garden that man, his warm baths another. Quintus Aurelius, a quiet and inoffensive man who thought his only share in the general calamity was to condole with others in their misfortunes, came into the forum and read the list of the prescribed, and finding his own name there said, Ah, woe is me, my Alban estate is prosecuting me. He had not gone far before he was dispatched. And not even Sulla's allies were safe. There was one guy called Lucretius Ofella, who was one of Sulla's senior officers, who had been with him since day one, who decided that he ought to have a stab at the consulship. And Sulla tried to warn him about this. He was like, Ofella, buddy. Don't, don't run for election. We're, we're not even doing elections. Like, I'm clearly in the middle of something here. But a fella, who showed an almost comic naivety, continued to petition for votes. He would walk around the forum being like, Yeah, election's coming soon. Vote for me. Lucretius a fella. I I'm going to do all kinds of cool things. Hey, when election day comes, don't forget my name. When a soldier brutally stabbed a fella to death in front of everyone, he was apprehended by a mob of citizens who dragged him before Sulla. But Sulla ordered that the man was released and revealed to everyone that he was the guy who ordered a fella's murder in the first place. In the aftermath of this, Sulla gave a public speech in which he told a story about a farmer plowing his fields. The farmer is bitten twice by the lice that live inside his clothes, and after the first two occasions he takes off his shirt and shakes it out. But when the lice bite him a third time, he burns his shirt so that he doesn't continue wasting his time. Sulla advised people who had bitten him twice already not to try their luck a third time. But Sulla was not completely immune to mercy. One of the names on his prescription list was a 19-year-old patrician called Gaius Julius Caesar. Hmm, 
Anyways, Caesar was related to Marius by marriage, and he himself had married the daughter of Cinna. Relentlessly hunted by Sulla's agents, Caesar spent ages in hiding, using the last of his money to bribe his way to safety. He was eventually taken off the list by Sulla, who was being petitioned every day by Caesar's friends and family. Sulla begrudgingly lifted Caesar's death sentence, but did so with a warning. In this Caesar fellow, he said, I see many a Marius. Whilst all of this was going on in Italy, Pompey sailed to Sicily, where he found and killed Carbo. On Rhodes, Norbanus was still hiding out, and he heard that the city elders were contemplating handing him over to Sulla. He saved everyone the time and energy by just killing himself. Metellus took an army to Spain, where he would spend eight years engaged in a gruelling guerrilla war trying to capture Sertorius. Sertorius would be the last of the Marians, ruling over his own kind of breakaway state on the Iberian Peninsula until his assassination in 72 BCE. In Rome, Sulla set about fixing things, as he saw it at least. But to do that, he would need constitutional power and legitimacy. He hadn't won an election in years. He was barely even a legal general anymore. Sure, he'd marched on the city of Rome and fought a civil war to get here, but the pretense of legality still had to be maintained. So Sulla revived an archaic Roman position, the dictatorship. As we've seen, the Republic was a complex web of checks and balances on individual power. It had been forged in the fires of a revolution against a monarchy, and as a result, there was nothing the Romans feared more than one single person holding too much power. The supreme magistracy in the Republic was the consulship, and it was a shared one, and it only lasted for a year. The defining trait of Rome's Republic was the dispersal of power amongst the leaders of the Senate. However, even the Romans knew that sometimes crises happen. Sometimes situations are so dire that you just need a guy who can come in and make decisions without all the baggage of Republican institutions or politics. So the position of dictator was founded, a man who would have absolute power over the city of Rome for six months. In years previously, the dictatorship had been used sparingly and only in dire circumstances, when Rome was facing possible destruction. Some of the most famous dictators include Cincinnatus, the humble farmer who dropped his equipment to go and lead Rome's armies in war against their neighbours before renouncing absolute power and returning to his plough. Another famous dictator is Fabius Maximus, who steered the ship of the Roman state during the traumatic invasion of Hannibal. But by the time of Sulla, the dictatorship hadn't been used in over a hundred years. Rome was a massive empire now. There simply hadn't been a point in recent history where the Romans feared that they might be wiped off the map. During the chaos of the Gracchi, the horrific invasion of the Cimbri and the Teutones, and the social war, there simply hadn't been a point when anyone thought, let's turn to a dictator to solve this. So Sulla was not only reviving a long gone, and in the eyes of many Romans, redundant office, but he did so without a term limit. All previous dictators had a term limit of six months on their power, but Sulla would hold dictatorial powers indefinitely. And Sulla's attitude towards those who hinted that this was, I don't know, unconstitutional and deeply illegal, is best summed up in the words of his right-hand man Pompey, who said, Do not quote laws to men with swords. With total power in his hands for as long as he wanted, Sulla set about revising the Roman political system. To start with, he greatly reduced the powers of the tribunate. This office had been designed to protect the regular people from the abuses of noble Romans. But as far as Sulla was concerned, it had gotten far too big for its boots. The careers of the Gracchi, of Sulpicius, of Drusus and Saturninus had proven this point. It was no longer about protecting the people, it was a weapon that they used to wield against their betters. Of course, Sulla couldn't abolish the office entirely, but he could reduce its powers and critically bar anyone who ever held it from ever holding a different political office. To become a tribune was now political suicide. 
No longer would this be a vessel by which populist politicians would advance their own careers. Speaking of advancing political careers, Sulla also restricted how quickly someone could climb the cursus honorum. Gone were the days of men like Marius the Younger holding a consulship at the age of 26, or Marius the Elder holding consulships year after year after year. From here on out, political careers started at the age of 30, and you had to climb that ladder one ring at a time. If you were a caster, good for you, but you shouldn't expect to be consul anytime soon, because you have to work your way up each individual office, like Sulla had had to. And if you were elected to office, well done you. You are now barred from holding that same position again for 10 more years. There would be no more consecutive magistracies. Sulla had been fine letting the issue of Italian enfranchisement slip through the cracks. That would be the small popolare victory that he would let them have. But everything else was gone. Rome would be rebuilt along optimate conservative guidelines. The Senate would be the ultimate power in Rome, and the aristocracy would have the last word on everything. By the year 79 BCE, Sulla had held absolute power over Rome for about two years, and in that time he'd changed everything. He had rebuilt the political order, redistributed the wealth of the city, and killed thousands. And then, kind of out of nowhere, Sulla walked into the Senate one day and declared that he was stepping down. He told everyone that he was done. He had made himself dictator to save the Republic, and as far as he could tell, he'd done that. Time for an election, I suppose. In what must have been a truly bizarre sight, Sulla, without warning anyone about it, simply removed the insignia of his office, dismissed his bodyguards, and walked out into the street. Completely unprotected, he wandered through the forum when some sycophants came up to him and said, Hey, Sulla, we hear you're holding an election. Uh, we get you, buddy. We wouldn't dream of voting for anyone other than you. Sulla told them that he wasn't interested, and he went home. And just like that, the most powerful man in the city, the man who had held the lives of every Italian in his hands, was just a regular dude again. On his way back to his house, Sulla was approached by a young boy at the side of the road who called him a tyrant. Sulla didn't respond, so the young boy followed him all the way back to his house, screaming profanities at him, all the way up until the point that Sulla was out of earshot. When he was finally inside, Sulla laughed and said, Lads like that, they'll prevent anyone else from ever giving up absolute power ever again. You know, Plutarch had it right when he said that Sulla was a man of two personalities. Terrifyingly serious and severe whenever conducting business, and completely laid back and chilled out whenever he was at leisure. And in his retirement, Sulla became a full-time man of leisure. Sulla then invited a bunch of his old friends from his twenties to come and live with him. Roscius the Comedian, Sorex the Impressionist, and Metrobius the Drag Queen all made their way to Sulla's villa, and together they partied and made merry all day long. Sulla's retirement is honestly so weird. Like, how often in history does a man this powerful give up absolute control without anything seeming to force his hand? The writer Appian seems a little vexed by this. You know, Sulla could command the loyalty of tens of thousands of legions. He was still capable, he was still relatively young. But Appian concludes his musings on Sulla's retirement by saying, I believe that, sated with war, sated with power, and sated with Rome, he finally fell in love with rural life. But sadly, Sulla would not enjoy his retirement for very long. His hard partying lifestyle was aggravating a disease that was slowly eating away at him. In his dreams, he saw a prophecy of his own death when a goddess appeared to him and told him his life would soon end. In Plutarch's version of the dream, Sulla is approached by his deceased son, who says to him, Pursue an end to anxious thoughts, and come with him and his mother Metella to live there in peace and quietness with her. Sulla, ever the superstitious man, also recalled the words of a Chaldean soothsayer, who told him when he was a young man that he would die at the height of his fortunes. And in about three days' time, Sulla wrapped up his memoirs, wrote an updated version of his will, and died. And so, in 78 BCE, at the ripe old age of 60, Lucius Cornelius Sulla 
past from history. On the day of his funeral, veterans gathered from all round Italy to see their old general off to the afterlife. Rain clouds gathered, threatening to postpone the funeral, but the weather stayed good, and as the funeral pyre was lit, a great wind was said to whip up, which consumed the dictator in flames, and when there was only bones left, the rain finally fell. And so, to the very end, Sulla was lucky. A great monument was raised in his memory on the Campus Martius. The inscription on it read, No friend ever served me, and no enemy ever wronged me, whom I have not repaid in full. Sulla had burned Rome to the ground and rebuilt it. And in his own mind, he had done this to end the madness of the last 50 years and restore the traditional republic. But what was Sulla's lasting legacy? As the republic's saviour? Sadly, not even close. Far from preserving the republican system, Sulla had only pushed it further towards destruction. Sulla was actually quite lucky to die so soon after resigning the dictatorship. Had he lived much longer, he might have been around to see everything he had worked to achieve crumble into dust. Sulla had beaten Mithridates, but he had not destroyed him. In fact, he was so hasty to return to Italy and get rid of Marius that he concluded a pretty favourable peace with the king. As a result, Mithridates would return, and Rome would have to fight two more wars against him before he was finally beaten. His political reforms didn't even last a decade. Within a few years of his death, the tribunate was back at full strength, and the families of those men who he had prescribed, who he had barred permanently from entering public office, paid no heed to this after Sulla was dead. Devoid of their leader, Sulla's lieutenants began squabbling amongst themselves for power in Rome, and the restrictions of Sulla's constitution meant nothing to them. In the year 70 BCE, eight years after Sulla died, Crassus and Pompey, two of his most devoted followers, shared the consulship. Pompey was only 36 years old, and he had never held another magistracy in his life. Sulla had also failed to permanently erase popular politics from the Roman world. I mean, sure, the Populari politicians went into hibernation for a little bit whilst he was still around, but soon after his death, Populare politics was back, and it would stay an important part of Roman life for decades to come. Sulla had broken the law to do good. He had marched an army against his own city to save it, at least in his own mind. But in the minds of those that lived through it, they didn't remember Sulla's ideals, they didn't remember his political suggestions or his legal reforms. They remembered the fact that he had marched an army against his own city to achieve his own ends. So ironically, Sulla's main legacy is wrapped up in Gaius Marius's. Gaius Marius had completely reformed the Roman army, professionalised the legions, and then Sulla had taken those legions and shown how they could be manipulated to achieve his own political ends. Sulla had not been the one to start political violence in Rome, but he had taken it to a new and unprecedented extreme. When future Romans looked back at their history and wondered how their republican system had descended into despotism, they started with Sulla. He had fought the first civil war, but it wouldn't be the last. Sulla no doubt hoped that he would be remembered by future generations as a defender of the old order, the man who had taken Rome back to its roots. Instead, he would be remembered as the first of a new order, and the man who pushed the Roman Republic into the final chapter of its life. Within 50 years of Sulla's death, the Republic that he loved so much was gone. That was a really long video. That is probably the longest one I've ever done. I don't know, I'll only find out when I've cut it down. But if you're still here at the end, thank you very much for watching. It was good fun to make. Hope I see you next time.